Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome. Uh, welcome to the Tortoise Education Summit, a gathering of the biggest names in education, as well as students, teachers and employers all from around the world. Um, I'm Merope Mills. I'm a partner and editor at Tortoise. I was very pleased to see that someone was having dancing in the kitchen to that music in between the sessions, because this is, in fact, our second thinking of the day, a day full of crackingly interesting events and I'd like to start by thanking our, our lead partner Santander and uh, our knowledge partners Nuffield Foundation and 2020 Delivery uh, for their support of the uh, Education Summit today. Um, I'd just like to start by talking about how a uh, digital thinking works. Um, just to say you've been automatically muted when you came onto this call, that's not because we don't want to hear from you, we definitely do, but it's just so we don't hear your uh, dishwashers going off or your children screaming or whatever's happening in the background um but so there are two ways we can we can hear from you and they are uh, if you look at if you hover your mouse over the screen you can see a chat function and uh there's a little chat box and my colleague ella hill is in the chat box uh and is is ready to have a conversation with you there if you're feeling shy and you don't want to talk. But if you do, please do join me in conversation uh, by uh, raising your hand. There should be a raise hand at the bottom of your screen as well. A little blue digital hand comes up uh, and uh, I can come to you. And uh, as is all tradition with Tortoise Thinkings, uh, we do tend to have one rule, which is no questions. We do want to hear your thoughts on this important so uh, subject, your thoughts and experience, which is who has uh, the best education system in the world. And in this conversation, we really want to get into the heart of who teaches best, how they do it, and what other countries can learn from their success. And I have three great guests to uh, start me off uh, with that conversation. Uh, we have Andreas uh, Schlescher. Uh, he is the Director for Education and Skills at the Organisation for Economic uh, Cooperation and Development. Uh, we've got Parsi Salberg, who is Professor of Education Policy at the University of South Wales and author of What Can the World Learn from the Education System in Finland? And Sue Chepa Bat, who is the CEO of Dream a Dream, which does after school training for the poorest children in India. But before I come uh, to you, could I go first to my colleague, Chris Cook, who is the former policy editor of BBC Newsnight and our resident education professor in the office. Um, uh, uh, Chris, just to start us off, what is your answer to the question, uh, who has the best education system in the world? So um, I think that's a, that's a question in which we have a surprisingly thin evidence base and almost all of the best evidence comes really from Andrea Schleicher's work um, at the OECD. Um, Andreas administers a test known as PISA, um, which is a triennial test. Every three years, 15 year olds from across the world uh, take a, uh, a test that, that in sequence either focuses on reading or science or maths. Um, and it gives us a, a gauge of what um, school systems are actually achieving. And we've actually, we've got a slide we can put up that shows this is a, what was known as a candlestick graph. So rather than giving you a league table and a list of all the best countries, um, the benefit of the candlestick graph is gets us, allows us to sort of answer the question about um, who the best systems are in a slightly more sophisticated way. So a candlestick graph, right? So there's a, if you look there, each of those bars represents a country. So the, um, the, the highest achieving countries on PISA are at the right. I haven't included all of them. This is a sort of sample, but the, weaker countries in our sample are on the left. Um, the fat bit of the graph, if you like the candle in the candlestick, is, uh, shows basically how the middle half of students do. So that fat bit on the graph, the candle, is the 25th to 75th percentiles, to use the technical terms. If you go from, if you like, the bottom of the candlestick to the top of the wick, that's from the 10th to the 90th percentiles. So you can see that, for example, if you look at the um, there's a run of countries from the OECD average, the one in orange, out to sort of five or six countries to the right. And if we were to report this as a sort of league table with just median scores, one would, you know, you'd say, oh, well, Sweden's much better than the US, which is better than the UK. One of the key things to get across is actually that one of the things that PISA tests show us is the extent to which school systems are in, in quite important regards, quite similar. We're talking about different um, differences of sort of degree for the most part, those candlesticks sort of overlap. Children, even if you go to somewhere like Singapore and compare them to someone like Britain, you can see that 
it's not that every child in Singapore is beating every child in Britain, which is sometimes how some of these things sort of come across, is that uh, in that case in particular, very high achieving students are doing better than in England and some of their lower achieving students are doing better too, or most of their lower, lower achieving students. Um, the reason I prefer to show this as a candlestick rather than if you like a league table is first of all that point that, that we sometimes lose track of the fact that kids are doing roughly the same in roughly similarly rich countries for the most part, there are exceptions. So Finland is an exception, the East Asian countries are exceptions, Estonia, which I've not included is an exception, Canada always does very well. Um, and we should look at those sort of those, those places, which often I have to point out tend to be quite little places um, and think about what they're doing better. But there are a few less other things, right? So one of the things that's striking from this graph, I think, is that places that are good for good places that are good for high achieving students tend to be good for low achieving students. So you don't do well by dumping your weaker kids. If you look at the difference between Sweden and Ireland, you can see that Sweden's getting a higher score. Actually, um, Ireland gets a higher score precisely because it's much better for, for lower performing children. I'd also stress quite a lot of, um, it's gonna sound quite conservative, but um, care about what you can and can't learn from other countries. So um, I described, when I was an educational reporter at the FT, I continually described Andreas as Austrian until his office had to ring me and tell me he's actually German. Um, but <laughs> he will give us, I'm sure, some, some reflections on this, but the, um, English education has explicitly aimed to copy German education and technical skills for 150 years, since the 1860s. And we have never managed to do it because fundamentally it's built on cultural and political priors that we cannot replicate in the UK. We cannot get businesses to take on an apprentice, for example, um, even if they don't need it, which is kind of what the German, like what's expected in Germany it's also the case that the things like license to practice, the idea that you can't open a bakery without, you know, having served as a baker in a, in a bakery is, is a thing that sounds like banal and small, but is enormously important for underpinning the structure. And it's really difficult basically to have a Swedish style education system without Swedish style equality. It's difficult to have a German education system without the German attitude to business. It's difficult to have um, the Finnish education system without the Finnish prestige for um, for teaching. But yes, so I'm I'm quite a skeptic about about how much we can learn from elsewhere. Okay. But it's the there's certainly things to be taking away from from uh, some of the, particularly the smaller places that do very well on these tests. Thank you, Chris. I'm going to come to An Andreas, who's a uh, surname I pronounce. Badly, I'm sorry, Andreas, uh, but you're definitely German, not Austrian. You, you produced the um, stats behind Chris's candlestick graph. Could you could you give us your view on on, on what those systems to the right end of uh, of the graph have in common? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but you know, before you know, going into the statistics, I think if you want to figure out what the best education system is you need to have a clear idea of what you expect from a good education system. And I think one thing I want to say is that the kind of things that are easy to teach and also easy to test have also become easy to digitize, to automate, mm -hmm. to outsource in the way, in the world in which we live. And uh, in a way we have figured out how to educate second class robots, you know, people who are good at repeating what we tell them. But I think in this time of artificial intelligence, we need to think harder about what makes us human. Now, how do we complement, not substitute the intelligence that we created in our technologies? And I think that's a very important question. So I think we should you know, get to a quite high level of sophistication when we talk about the best education system. You know, in a way, what you expect from young people is that they can think for themselves, that they can work and live with others. and. Uh, that they develop a strong sense of right or wrong and things like this. And these are things that are often not easy to capture in statistics. But, you know, getting to your question, the first thing that I learned is that leaders in high performing education systems, the ones on the right, have convinced their citizens to value the future. Now you can see Chinese or Singaporean parents or grandparents are going to invest their last effort their last kind of resources into the education of their children. It's the future of their country. If you look to Europe, we have already spent the money of our children for our own consumption. And that's why we are highly indebted. So I think it's the value on the future. I think that's very important 
Second point I want to make is that they have a deep belief that every child can learn. You know, in many education systems, we start to sort and segregate children early on in different tracks and streams, believing that only some people can really be very, very good. And what you can see in some systems on the right side, and this time I would quote, you know, systems like Canada, like uh, Finland, like Estonia, uh, they are able to capitalize on the talent of every student they know and understand how different students learn differently and embrace that diversity with very differentiated uh, practice. So that I think is a second kind of characteristic. And then third, and that's pretty obvious, the quality of an education system will never exceed the quality of teaching and the teaching practices. And the quality of teaching practices that you see is never going to exceed the kind of work organization that we put around uh, uh, teachers. And what you can see in many systems on the right side is that they may actually ask their teachers to teach less than you know, a teacher in Britain, but those teachers actually often work more and they spend just a very high share of their time doing other things than teaching, working with individual students outside the classroom setting, you know, working social work, psychological work, working with other teachers to frame good practice, you know, investing in innovation and research. Ask yourself why those countries were so quick in this pandemic to get on top of this. And this is because they have a teaching force who are not just you know, instructors, but who are also amazing coaches, who are amazing kind of facilitators, amazing researchers. So I think a very, very strong profession clearly is the cornerstone of a high performing education system. And you can see that reflected in the work organization. And um, uh, you can see that reflected in, you know, those systems have moved from vertical you know accountability systems and information structures to a lot of collaboration they have a high degree of professional autonomy but they always value a collaborative culture now, so i think those things are uh, are really really important if you want to do well and then uh, last point really is that many of the highest performing education system have made the closest school always the best school and by that I mean is that they're very very good in attracting the most talented teachers into the most challenging classrooms and to align resources with this, this needs with when you look to you know Finland uh, Denmark Estonia uh, you can see almost no variation in school performance as a parent you can enroll your child in every part of the system because the system ensures consistency in uh, the services and I think that's a very very important part of a high performing education system as well that you know uh, you don't put it on the shoulders of parents to figure out what a good school is but you take care as a system that uh, quality is uh, quite well spread out so there are different attributes uh, across countries now uh, the question that was quite justified from Chris you know to what extent can you emulate them. And uh, I'm actually more optimistic uh, than Chris on this. I do believe many of the walls that we, I mean, everybody considers themselves unique and, you know, we can, uh, we are in a special context and so on. But when you actually look at this through the lens of, of, of research, you can actually see that most of those attributes that are highlighted, uh, you can call them culture, but they are created, not inherited. Uh, they are part of the education system. And, and I do think there's a lot that, uh, we can learn from each other, that teachers can learn from the neighboring teacher, that schools can learn from the neighboring school, and that countries can learn uh, from each other. Surely you can never copy and paste an education system wholesale. I don't think that's, that's, that's pretty obvious, but I think you can ask yourself what makes an education system successful? What are those kinds of factors and how can you configure them in your own education context? Thank you so much. Uh, there's a lot of chat um, I can see about how you measure well-being. If that's so important, how how can we do that? Yeah, actually, you know, um, uh, two hundred years ago, we asked ourselves those questions for mathematics and science, and we figured it out. And actually, I think we're on a very very good track. Even in Pisa, we do now have, I think, quite good measures of student well-being. We are also working on metrics to assess social and emotional outcomes of, of learning. Uh, surely this is a challenge today, but I, I, you know, that was the same for, for very traditional subject matter disciplines. I think actually, uh, and I do believe it's very important if we do not succeed to build good metrics around those attributes, uh, we are unlikely to value them. 
the signal that we're going to send to students, to teachers, is that only what is measured is really valued. So I do think we need to redouble our effort. And I think science has advanced enormously. You know, uh, even your mobile phone knows, knows a lot about, you know, your curiosity, your courage, your leadership skills. You know, I think actually big data and uh, artificial intelligence have become very powerful to capture not just, you know, our cognitive skills, but a lot of other dimensions as well. And I think uh, we should just, you know, rather than pushing that agenda aside, you know, do this better. You know, we need to improve our metrics and I think we can. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll come to uh, Parsi now. Uh, as it happens, I spoke to you before this and I also asked you the same question. And again, you wouldn't be drawn on a country, although you have written a book about one, but you also said that uh, schools had particular things in common. What were they? Were they very similar? Uh, yeah, of course, you know, I, I think Andreas raised a very important point of, uh, you, you know, what are we expecting or, or hoping to see from good education systems. And I would just like to add there that, you know, education systems are much more than just the first nine, eight or nine years of schooling. That if you ask the question, what is the best education system, then of course we should look at the whole entire system. And, uh, and whereas uh, PISA data is very useful and helpful in informing you know part of the system but it doesn't tell us anything about the the secondary or higher education or lifelong learning uh, and that's often constitutes the lot even larger part of the education than what we are measuring um, but you know continuing from the what, what Andrea was Andreas was saying about the these three things um, you know I, I know that there are many people probably there in the audience who would expect now uh, me uh, coming from Finland and now now living and working in Australia, Sydney, Australia, that, that the answer, brief answer to this question is that of course Finland has the, the best education system, and you know it's, it may be true that Finland has a good education system and maybe maybe the the world class system in some areas, but again, it's a very hard hard to answer the 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 broad question like edu whole education system. But for me, uh, as you said, that the the more interesting thing is to look at some of those things that are common, just like Andres was speaking about these things that are common in these systems. And if I just, uh, like uh, Andres said, that if I may, may contribute three things here that in my research and own work uh, and the work of others who have been uh, exploring this thing <coughs> come, come about. I think the first one, and it's uh, certainly, you know, part of the being a good system of education is that uh, it's built on the idea of collaboration and, and cooperation, you know, doing things together uh, between the schools and and within the classrooms and uh, you know between the the regions in the country and countries as well rather than compete against one another and now you you know you you, you need to keep in mind that i'm looking at these things now from the global south from australia where where these things are completely different than they were in in nordic countries or in finland so you know rather than com competing insisting schools and and people to compete against one another and see that you who get the most money or get the highest grades you know build the system around this idea that education is fundamentally a kind of a collaborative collective uh, thing that we should do together so that's one one of those ideas then the other one i think that has been really an interesting thing to look at now during the this pandemic that we have and the, all the school clo closures is the the um, flexibility and creativity that is built in the education systems and and here again the systems are very different uh, many of the education systems have been kind of a, trying to respond to this pandemic situation with this kind of a framework of standardization a kind of a fixed um, uh, very rigid system um, and here for example I've, I've seen kind of many schools in this pandemic situation waiting for somebody to come and tell them what to do next. Whereas the, for example, in Finland, where there's much more creativity and flexibility in this system, uh, the, the, the note immediately from the, the kind of a minister's office to the schools was that go and find out the best way to keep kids on learning and, and make, make sure that they get best out of this, where that immediately mobilized the professionalism and, and, and talent that is in the Finnish schools to do these things. So this flexibility and creativity is uh, extremely important. And then Andreas didn't mention this, uh, perhaps the, the, the most interesting and important aspect that is uh, 
linked to uh, most of the this high performing education system is there kind of a deliberate focus uh, on equity in education that makes sure that the, the system is designed in a way that it doesn't it th th tries kind of a play down the the influence of the family background that often is a very high determin, uh, determinant of the how well the kids do in school or, or whether they fail in the school. So, you know, if, 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 I, if I have to say three things that I, I, would, uh, I would take away from this uh, high performing successful system, certainly Finland, these are those three. I also uh, think a little bit differently, but probably more optimistically than Chris about this learning from others. You know, in the end, you, the, the fact is that the Finnish system before the first PISA in the year 2000, um, was in a situation that was pretty much built on the ideas from other countries. The whole system design came from Sweden and Norway and, and pretty much the, the curriculum idea and ped pedagogy and methodology, the thinking, the, the whole ethos of education came from other countries, which is a kind of a sign of, you know, learning from others can produce good results. But that is just like Andrea said, that is a difficult thing to do. This, these are very complex issues. And I think that this is where the OECD's uh, role has been very important, is to guide people and governments and policymakers and researchers to, to really, uh, to this art of learning from other systems and, and make them benefit your own. Okay, I'd, I'd love to talk to you more about Finland, but I'm, I'm conscious of, of, of time and other guests and people with their hands up. So uh, I'm, I'm going to go to Sue Chetha next, but I'd just like to say if we could speak to, I think it's Yelena who's had her hand up for a, a while. And I saw in chat Tony P um, talking against uh, ranking generally as, as a form, of, whether it's by country or within schools. And I think John Goddard's just put his hand up as well. So we'll come to them. But Sue Chetha, you first. Um, you, you're, we're speaking to you from India. Uh, you run a program um, to support schools working with the poorest in India. When you hear how great Finland is and, you know, consider the advantages that they have, which is that they are a, a rich, small, equal society, does it feel like there is anything you can learn from them or is it just such a different situation? So as I'm listening, uh, as I was listening to Andrea and uh, Pasi, the imagery I was getting is that when we're talking about education and how education reform happens, it's such a journey. And one way to look at it is where our country is on this journey. And uh, when we talk about collaboration, teacher training, you know, and these new ways, well-being being part of education, that is where we want to go. But if I were to just outline where India is currently, uh, so of course, if you're talking about India, we have a population of 1.3 billion right? That, that is the context in which everything is happening in India. And we have a geographical area, which is about a third the size of US. And in that densely populated country, about 70% of people are living at less than $2 a day, and almost 30% at $1 a day. So that's extreme poverty. So we have 130 million children in India who live in poverty. In that size and complexity, for me, where India is on its journey, we were one of the, uh, one of the countries to uh, ratify the right to education as a fundamental right. So it's, it's a, a law in our country that every child must get access to education. And this was just in 2010. And since then, uh, in the last, like an annual status of education in India, we, we found that today we are at enrollment rates of 96% which basically means we have 230 million children going to school every day, right? That's a big achievement because this is almost a 30, 40% increase in the last 20, 30 years where children have been taken out of child labor, being used as, uh, you know, in the informal sector to joining the formal school system. It drops by the time you go to secondary education, it's 40%, but that's still 100 million, right? So I think, again, I, I resonate with that what Andreas is saying that when we're talking about best education systems, we must be cognizant of where in the journey we are and then what are we really looking at as good education systems? Because, yeah, so that's kind of where I am at in terms of where India is, but that doesn't mean we have to take a linear approach. So that's where I think we can learn from other education systems. It doesn't have to be linear. Okay, now I got children into school. Now let me first, you know, get them to learning grade, then we like think about well-being. I don't think the way forward should be linear. We could leapfrog. We have an opportunity today 
to leapfrog in, in that uh, dimension or in that strategy, we can learn from others and we don't have to either make the same mistakes that other countries have done, but we can definitely take on some of the best practices, all of uh, what he was talking about and look at how we can contextualize it to India. So we are not, again, you know, just as per the Brookings report, we're currently a hundred years behind. And if we followed a linear path, it would take a hundred years for children in India to catch up to the same learning levels as children from uh, first world countries. So that's where I see the opportunity to learn from other education systems. I mean, when we spoke before, because um, again, I had a conversation with you, you yesterday, and you said, so, you know, so much of the problem uh, with, with the Indian education system is that there's a, a hangover from British colonial uh, ideas and, and, and you know, it, the, the education system isn't designed for marginalized communities. Yes. And you're just very keen not to make that mistake again. Yes, exactly. I think that's, that's the caution. And I didn't want to open with that, but that's the caution. When we look at India today, right, uh, I heard Chris also talk about it, it's so contextual, like in India, pre-British, it was a caste-based system of education. So depending on which caste you were born into, you would either learn the rituals. If you were a, a Brahmin, you would learn uh, religion and scripture. If you were a Shudra, you would be a working class learning manual labor, right? So it was a caste system. Then the British colonized the entire education system. So everybody got the same education, but it was only the elite, you could only get elite. And college became kind of a measure of success that if you went to college, you became successful. So it's such a complex, dense, class, caste, colonized system today. And on that, when I overlay poverty, right, there's 47 million children who are stunted, which basically means even though I have access to education, I'm not cognitively developed to access it, to understand, you know, to process information because stunted growth is an indicator of stunted development. Uh, so that's the complexity and that's, and that's when we can't, again, just look at Western models or simply look at Finland, for example, because it's, the context is so different. So while we must look at philosophical questions of education, what is the purpose of education? How must we focus on well-being? How do we look at the interconnectedness of the planet? How do we prepare children for a global world? Those are questions we can learn from each other, but not, you know, project-based learning or online learning, which is such a nightmare today in India. So that's not the level at which we learn from each other. Uh, and we must be wary of that. To what extent are we simply emulating the West uh, and how much are we contextualizing it to India? Thank you so much. Let, let's go to some of those those people um, I spoke to before. Is it, is it, is it Kelena? How do I say your name? Are you there? Or I think there was a John Goddard. If, oh, hello, hello. Where, where, it's, where it's, are yeah, you I'm there. from? By the way. Hello. Uh, I'm, from, I'm from the West Midlands. Lovely okay. sunny day. Uh, uh, and, and what are your thoughts? I think it's really interesting and, and the discussion has been so interesting because for me, education reform has to tie in with our wider discussions about political regionalism and decentralization. And it's something we've been talking about a lot with Tortoise recently as well. But I firmly believe that more successful education systems are those which are those that devolve power to the teachers against having strict national curriculums, against having um, you know, national settings with exams. And I think it's interesting, all of the speakers that have um, preceded me have spoken about the sort of problems perhaps of international comparisons between different systems but why don't we look at that on a national level as well and consider why we impose very strict national restrictions to our schools so it's interesting I was looking at the OECD PISA test for 2018 and Estonia outperformed the UK in basically everything and yes you can attribute that to many things including the fact they've got much higher quality early years education most of their children aren't tested when they leave kindergarten, they have all ability classes, digital learning, all these different things. But something that's common across education systems is that they're, that are better than the UK, I should say, is that their schools tend to be much freer. There's a much more limited national curriculum. They tend to highly value having high quality teachers. That's something that I think um, Passy and Andreas both pointed out earlier on as well. Um, and those teachers have autonomy in designing their lessons in how they teach their students. And I think something that coronavirus really pointed out actually is how um, we have a real problem with teaching and how we perceive our teachers in the UK. 
um, because there's an almost skepticism about how they, not only how they teach, but how they mark um, assessments. We saw that with the cancellation of exams. Um, but I would say that teachers are probably best qualified to assess their students' successes. They're the ones that spend the most time with them. Um, and I know that there are issues around the sort of subjective nature of teacher assessment rather than exams and, and different studies say different things. But I think more holistically, if we're looking at education, we're looking at well-being, all these other things we're talking about, teachers are those who are able to consider students' um, continued participation and engagement with learning. And I do hope that post-COVID, we have more, um, you know, it's an opportunity for teachers to have more autonomy and respect. But ultimately, I do think that we need to... Con UK education reform as part of this wider discussion on regionalization and decentralization um, and giving teachers and schools more autonomy and flexibility to implement their own programs, their own methods of assessment um, against this long term commodification of education that we've seen really since the introduction of the national curriculum and beforehand arguably too. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, thank you very much Ellen, for your uh, for your contribution. And 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 is there if John is there there as well, John Goddard? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can we well, see it, you as well? Uh, okay, I'm, I'm John Goddard. I'm, I'm uh, emeritus professor at Newcastle University and, and also a professor in in Birmingham University in in universities and cities. Really like to follow that last comment. Geography matters so much to how education systems develop. Um, and, and it's been a little bit blind on all of that until that last intervention. Um, schools, universities are embedded in their local communities and the whole well-being learning experience is shaped by that context. And I do think we tend to be quite territorially blind, geographically blind in the way we think about education. Uh, education systems have evolved. In the UK, higher education is territorially blind. School education was at least embedded in communities, but that's been uh, ended to a degree because you've got chains now of, 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 of schools. FE, which used to be further education, which used to be very much local, is now being nationalised. Indeed, the government is about to take over FE colleges um, in, in, into, a, into a national system. So this whole, we cannot, and, and the cri critical point post COVID is the communities within which our education institutions, schools and universities are embedded are facing fundamental challenges about how they move forward and redevelop. And so we do need in thinking about higher educational systems, a much more place-based view of how they develop. And in the UK, we've had a civic university commission, but again, that's mainly been higher education, but how does it relate to FE, to schools and to lifelong learning? So I would urge very strongly, we think about um, the importance of place and geography in the way in which we manage and develop and bring in all the issues that have just been raised about devolution and so on. But by and large, parts of government that are interested in place do not have any role and in, in, in an increasingly marginal role in, in education systems. Thank you. Thank, thank you, John. And I can see Alan's got his hand up. Let's make sure we can go to him as well. But I think we've got Tony at the ready. Tony, are you there? Is, have we got a Tony on the line? Yes, okay. I, Hello, I don't know if anybody can hear me. Yes. Okay. We can hear you. Hi, Tony. Well, um, I, I feel a bit intimidated today because you know, I've never been paid to educate anyone. Don't, don't I'm, a, I'm a volunteer, have been for 15 years. Um, in Wales, uh, thinking about what Mr. Goddard said about place, we have a very poor place here. 70% of the economy depends on government. And we live out here, West Wales, even in some of the poorer areas of Wales. But I notice uh, that the devolution of education, which I think has been for most part of 20 years, means that in Wales, uh, there might be a better chance to achieve change because we're dealing with a smaller education bureaucracy and less degrees of freedom in terms of who knows who to try and make connections and get things to change. However, I notice even in the latest curriculum being designed for Wales for all levels of school, um, to A levels, which will come into play in two years time, that 
there is a overriding belief still in children having natural and innate abilities and that colors the entire way that education is done and i don't think wales is the only place where that's the case so to me that's a thank very you. big impediment thank you thank you very much and um, have we got alan there hello alan uh can you hear me sorry yeah. hello alan where are you calling from i'm from reading and um, I'm 18 years old and um, you know, I'm just about to go off to, uh, I'm taking a gap year and then going to go to university. So the things I've been thinking about are, is the fact that the internet has really democratized and distributed information. I can pretty much learn anything I want on the internet for free. So universities no longer have a monopoly on information. Mm. I think the purpose of um, degrees and really a university education is really to alleviate information asymmetries when it, with respect to like employees, employers, because they need a third party to you validate your skill set. When you put, you know, say, oh, I, I know how to program Python. I, I, I studied computer science. They need a third party to um, confirm that. Um, notion. So um, what you see with them, um, I think what you see with degrees now is that even though the top, I, I think the top degrees and the top universities, the level of education that you gain at those universities, I think it's marginal compared, compared to other universities. But I think because um I think because now the the main the main um commodity that um universities are um selling is um essentially reputation. I think Oxbridge is um desirable because not because of the edu not because of the knowledge gained at Oxbridge that is gained at Oxbridge Oxbridge is um much better than anywhere else, but because it's hard to get to, so it's a proxy for talent. So what we need is probably apprenticeships to be as competitive as uh, uni degrees. Competition is always good. It's going to lead to, you know, innovation and it's going to lead to um, the quality of education improving, but also it'll give students more choice. And I think we should encourage first principles thinking in the sense that instead of um, teaching students uh, a particular method or methodology or skill set for a specific domain of questions, a, a very narrow problem set, we should, we should work backwards from problems. And then the utility of those methods and um, techniques will become evident. And I think we should really play to people's strengths. Okay, I think we should te teach the basic necessary skills, you know, whatever skills are um, uh, essentially um, are essentially prevalent across the thing, across um, different academic um, avenues. Okay, so Thank I think you. like critical thinking, things like um, mathematical, um, basic mathematical, um, basic, basic um, mathematical principles, things that are, you know, um, are evident scientific method, things are evident, you know, across different um, uh, uh, degrees and things like that. Thank you, Alan. You're getting a lot of love in the chat for your, for your excellent point. So I hugely appreciate you talking up. I'm quite conscious of time. So I'm just going to go back to um, uh, Parsi if I, if I can. Um, just because you've written a book about the Finnish education system, um, one of the best in the world. What I wanted to ask you uh, uh, was if, what, what are the downsides of the Finnish education system, which often comes at the top of league tables and how could it improve? I'd love to hear, uh, hear what the supposed top of the league table gets wrong. Yeah, I, I think first of all, the, the Finnish uh, educators and the whole system has never desired to be uh, seen as a, as a somewhere in in these league tables but you, you're absolutely right that's, that there are that's actually a very interesting are, course, point there that you make sorry to interrupt but just because it is the very fact of not desiring to be at the top of the league table table one of the things that gets them there i mean is that is that related yeah you, actually andres can probably say more about those uh, things but you know most of those high performing education systems that have been there during the last 20 years have never desired to deliberately be there and 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 on the other hand that many most of those who desire to be there on the top have not been able to climb up there so so that's a kind of a kind of an interesting thing but now when you you ask about the finnish uh, finnish thing of course you know there's no there's no perfect system of education and and um, you know if you look take a kind of an insider look in the in the finnish system there are a lot of things to uh, to improve but interestingly you know the, the finnish system has been suffering from a kind of a similar similar symptoms and things like Nokia, for example, that basically drove Nokia 
out of the mobile phone business a few years ago was the kind of a complacency uh, when uh, it became a, a, a kind of a, a uh, poster child of global education uh, 20 years ago. That it's very difficult, politically, it's very difficult to change the system that is uh, seen to be the best in the world. So any any minister or politician find it very difficult to do any any reforms or kind of next steps of uh, that would have been requi required in Finland 10 years ago when the system is regarded as the best in the world. So I would say that this has been one of the difficulties in the, in the Finnish system is to, to really uh, move it to the next level that now Andreas was talking about that and many others that what do we really need when the when the automation is taking taking many of those jobs away and knowledge also that can be done by the by the machines and Finland is still kind of a thinking about those things how to do um, how to do that at the level of the schooling. Hey, um, thank you so much Look, we we could we could go on and on, but I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm quite conscious of time. So I'd just like to take a moment uh, to thank everyone and, uh, and uh, try and wrap up some of the things that have been said. So we started by the question with the question, who is the best in the world? And we had uh, uh, Chris's candlestick graph uh, based on Andreas's data, which showed towards the right, the more successful end that we had Singapore, Finland and Canada, although I'm absolutely fascinated by uh, what Parsi just said, that, that, that the countries that aspire to be at, at the top of the league tables are often the ones that never get there. And there's, there's definitely a lesson from that. And, and the real thing that we want to know is what, what makes them good apart, uh, apart from not focusing on league tables? Well, uh, Chris made a point that the places that are good for high achieving students are also good for low achieving students, but there are other crucial things that we learned they had in uh, common. Um, they, I, I love what Andrea said at the start, that they are um, convinced, they convinced children to value their future. Uh, that, that's key to the Singapore education. And I, I thought, I wrote that down because I thought it was a really, uh, a, a really salient point. Um, uh, and Parsi and others made the point that they value a collaborative culture, uh, that, they, that they see learning as a creative act rather than a standardized, fixed, uh, box ticking system. Uh, and that there is a key uh, attitude of trust. I was fascinated by what Yelena said about Estonia uh, beating the UK on, on so many levels and how much freer they are as a result of that. Um, and how these countries that do well do focus on well-being. And obviously we need to redouble our efforts to work out how we measure that, but that's, that's key. Um, and, and John, what you said about place-based education uh, as a view of how we develop the future seems really important to me. We can't make sweeping generalizations from richer, more equal countries uh, to, to other countries, developing countries. We don't want to make the same mistakes uh, that, that we did in India, taking a British colonial system there. Uh, and Finland's context is completely different to India and Africa, but there are lessons that can be learned. And I do hope that post COVID uh, we have uh, we, we have learned and we've used this opportunity to treat teachers with more independence and respect, whatever country they are. So I'd just like to uh, say thank you again for all your contributions. Like again, our, our, our partners, Santander, the Nuffield uh, Foundation and 2020 Delivery. The uh, next thing in is at 10 a.m. and it is, should we abolish exams on this same Zoom link? So stick around, there'll be more groovy music in between, I'm sure. Um, we will be going dark for a few minutes uh, with everyone on mute. Um, and just to repeat what James said after the first session, if you're a Tortoise member, um, do continue to look at discussions and the notes and other upcoming sessions, it's all in the app. And if you're not a member, do join us for a 30 day free trial. Um, uh, and Ella will be sharing that in the chat. Uh, that's it right there. Thank you, Ella. Nicely done. Um, uh, so thanks again. I look forward to seeing you all at 10 o'clock or throughout the day. Many thanks to all our panellists and all your contributions. We will have to do an awkward wave because we cannot clap. Um, but thanks all for your enlightening conversation.